Hello everyone, welcome to my Dimmicks Chapter 1 event. I'm so happy you were able to join us. It feels a little strange to be sitting here in my little study talking to a computer, but I know that you guys are on the other end of it, so I'm remembering that. Um, this is where I write everything. You're seeing the very tidy view, I'd like to point out. It's been very uh, kind of manicured behind me. If I took the, the camera down and turned it around, you might see reality, so I'm definitely not going to do that. Um, but it is lovely to be able to do this and lovely to be able to connect and do an event in the midst of all of the craziness that we're all dealing with right now. Um, I've really enjoyed getting online and catching up and seeing writers that I love and admire from all over the world talking about their writing. People I wouldn't usually get a chance to see, you know, because they're US based or UK based or whatever. And that's been a real joy for me. So I hope that it's the same for you guys and that you're getting a chance to catch up with lots of different writers. And this is maybe the one thing I hope we carry forward after Corona time um, because I've really enjoyed it. So I hope it's the same for you. So tonight I'm going to talk to you a little bit about me, about how I became a writer and about my new book, The Good Turn. I'm always a little bit nervous when I do events that I'm telling the same old stories or cracking the same old jokes. So I'm going to try and tell you a few new things tonight. And one of the lovely things about doing an event this way, of course, is that I get to share photographs, which I can't usually do at live events. So I'm going to do a little bit of that as well um, and show you a little bit more about how I write and how I've come up with some of the ideas for my books. So where to begin? Um, this will probably come as a shock for a lot of you, given my very strong Australian accent, but I'm actually Irish. My husband and I moved here in October 2011 to Perth with our little boy, a little girl, Freya, who was two at the time, and I was extremely pregnant, very much expecting a baby who was born five years later. Um, it was a really difficult decision for us to leave Ireland and to leave Galway, you know. Um, we did leave at the end, tail end of the GFC, and we, you know, I was thoroughly burned out at that point. It hadn't been a very pleasant few years, but that didn't mean it was easy to leave, you know. We were very much embedded in Galway and Irish life. Now, if you don't know Galway, I'm going to kind of take advantage of this opportunity to show you a little bit of it. So these are photographs. Thank you very much, Tim. Tim's on the other end of this from Dimmix dealing with all the production stuff. So he's popped the photos up for me. This first photo here is uh, Key Street in Galway, obviously pre-corona social distancing. But it is that lovely. It's that pretty and picturesque. You know, there's no filter used here. And then for authenticity, on the right here, I've got my parents' favorite pub, a bunch of grapes, where we've spent many a good night. And then, uh, hi, Maria from Galway. Nice to hear from you. You know these places very well, obviously. And this is the Latin Quarter here in the bottom, obviously, with the Christmas decorations up. And it is just that gorgeous there. And Tim, if you're happy to pop on to the next picture. So the next photograph that's going to pop up, this is obviously a very different scene, but this is also in the city, looking up along the river Carib, over the bridge towards the cathedral. And the water there in wintertime is so dark and forbidding. Anybody who's read the ruin sort of knows the importance of that uh, bridge and the water to that story. That's right in the middle of um, Galway. And Tim, if you're happy to go to the next picture, this one is also relevant to the books because this is my old university. This is the quad and the Aula Maxima. Um, and I have to tell you that where I went to lectures was not this beautiful. <laughs> Most of my lectures took place in a in a not so pretty 1970s building a few hundred meters from this one. But this is the Aula and the college is so close to um, Galway that you can walk over the bridge into the pubs and and uh, and really enjoy the city. So that's part of what I loved about it. And this is one of the pubs. Uh, thank you, Tim. This is the Keys, which is my favorite pub in Galway. Kenny and I had our first date here. Believe it or not, we got engaged here. We're terrible romantics, clearly. <clears throat> My family still goes here on Christmas Eve for Christmas Eve drinks. And we God, I'd love to be going there with them this year. Maybe not this year. Um, so that is Galway. And I mean, we really were very much embedded in that life and we loved it very much. But so it was hard to leave. But I wouldn't be fully honest with you if I didn't show you the other side of Galway. This is what Galway looks like 90% of the time when the rain is coming down sideways. That's Shop Street in Galway and bouncing off the ground. And so when we left in October 2011, this was very much the weather that we had at the time. And though we were heartbroken to leave, what we arrived to is shown in the next photograph. This is Cottesloe Beach in Perth. And equally, this has no filter. This is how beautiful um, Perth can be. So there were compensations um, for our departure and our arrival here. And we did settle down, although it took us some time, you know, um, 
part of the issue with the settling down was our little boy was born five weeks after we arrived and he then chose not to sleep for two and a half years and I'm not even exaggerating when I say that so um, that was certainly challenging and then you know from a writing perspective it was always our intention when we came to Australia that I would try to write that when I did go back to work it would be part-time and I would ultimately try to write um, but it didn't happen straight away for a lot of reasons the first one was severe sleep deprivation there was simply no way I was going to be able to do anything other than just survive for the first while and the second thing really probably had to do with self-belief you know um writing had always been a dream for me but it's it's never something that's seen as realistic or truly possible you know certainly for most people I think that's the truth of it certainly not seen as a job that can allow you to pay your bills and the reality is for most writers it isn't so I really that wasn't what held me back it was more this feeling that writing is for other people that you know people who are really special or have this magical talent and you know I didn't really believe I could do it so it took me a long time to really really come to it and I think there was an, an inevitability about that for me as a writer and as a reader reading had been a deep passion of mine my entire life and then it just wasn't enough anymore at a certain point I needed to write to, ha to capture that same feeling that reading used to give me and so in 2014 I finally made a decision to really commit to it you know to really commit to trying and I took it seriously from the beginning you know I I treated it the same way I would any career change I said okay if I was going to change from law to some sort of business job you know I would expect it to take at least five years to requalify and to um and to sort of retrain myself and get enough experience that I was worth hiring so I figured five years minimum to commit to writing then if it was something that mattered so much to me and I started writing every night I had two small kids at the time and I was working so my only time to write was after bedtime 7 or seven thirty to 10 every night except for Thursday which was wine night which you don't mess with as we all know um I would write and it was really my time you know people kind of say well how do you do that when you're working and you're doing everything else but the truth is you do it because well I did it because it was the thing I was giving myself you know working was something I had to do looking after the kids is obviously giving to your children your family but when I would sit down in the evening with my cup of tea in front of the computer and sort of breathe out that was my kind of time I was giving myself and whether the writing was going well or not so well it was always a gift to myself if that makes sense so for anybody out there who's thinking about trying to write I think you have to feel that way because if it's a chore on top of all your other chores it's very difficult to do that and it's hard to be consistent and to keep going and everything else now I have to say my early writing was truly terrible and that's no false modesty that is simply the truth um and i think a lot of people who start out trying to write are discouraged by that you know i think most of us who want to write are obviously readers you know we read and we read and we read and we've read all our lives and we have um thank you very much judith um but we have this passion for reading and as a result of that we know what's good you know you kind of know what's good and so you start writing and your first stuff is not good and you can see that and so you say well I'm not a writer I don't have the talent for this I'm just going to walk away but the truth is that is not really how it works writing like many things is a craft that can be learned yes there must be a talent and a passion for it but also there are methods behind writing and if you give yourself time to learn you will see your writing improve really really quickly and I certainly felt that way I mean initially writing anything getting a paragraph 400 words on the page was such a struggle you know and then I'd read that paragraph the next day and it was so bad but ultimately it does start getting better so I was kind of I'm kind of surprised looking back in a way that I actually kept going but I think it was because there was always something really special there I mean the best way I can describe it is if you think about your favorite reading day like my favorite reading day is I'm either curled up on the couch or I'm lying in bed and I have, you know, nobody asking me for anything. Either the kids are out or they're happy doing something else or whatever. And I have like a blanket and a cup of tea and I have a book by my favorite writer and it's not disappointing me. Like it's just taking off and I'm with my favorite characters and you've got that like kind of burble in your stomach and you're just happy, you know? Well, writing on a really good day 
is like that times 10. And I know that's annoying, but it is, it really is on a really good day when the story is starting to come to life in your hands. And like these characters that you that you love. And okay, well, if it's one of my books, probably something terrible is about to happen to them, but there's hope, you know, there's always hope. And you, you the story is, is taking on life of its own and bringing you somewhere. When that happens, it's just the best feeling in the world. So even when you're struggling with your writing and the words coming up on the page are not so great, um, that brings you back in and brought me back and kept me writing. And for the really bad times when you're really struggling, thankfully someone has invented Twitter. So that's quite useful from a procrastination point of view. So there were certainly a few nights there where I should have been writing and instead I was fooling around on Twitter. But it did bring me um, to somewhere. So one of the nights that I was fooling around on Twitter, I came across something called a uh, Twitter pitch competition. And I don't know if you guys have heard of these. Unless you're an aspiring writer, it probably wouldn't have crossed your path. But if you are, you've probably seen them. Basically what they are is a bunch of writers get on Twitter and using a particular hashtag, they pitch their books in 140 characters. That's really all you have. And literary agents will read that feed. And if they see a pitch that they think is interesting, they will like it. And all that means is that you're invited to send them your query letter and maybe your first 50 pages, which you could do anyway. And by liking your tweet, there's like a chance that they'll move your pitch up the slush pile, maybe. But equally, they might not. So it doesn't actually mean a hell of a lot. But when you're an aspiring writer and you're working away quietly by yourself, I can tell you every little bit feels like a huge thing, you know. So that particular night, I um, decided I would give it a go. I would give it a lash. I would pitch my book, which was The Ruin that I was writing at the time. And in preparation for tonight, I went and I found my original Twitter pitches, which is really embarrassing for me, but might be entertaining for you because they're brutal. Um, so I'm going to pop them up on screen if Tim, if Tim can do that for me. The second one contains a giant spoiler for The Ruin. So I'm going to read out the first one, but I won't read out the second one. So before the second one comes up, if you haven't read The Ruin, look away, okay? Anyway, this is really bad. So this is what I wrote. I said, this is the first one. Maud's brother is dead. Can she find his killer and expose the police cover up? cover up because I was running out of characters before they stumble onto the truth of her past hashtag TKA20 hashtag M hash, hashtag WF I can't even remember what those hashtags were I think M was mystery I can't remember the others so that was my first pitch now guys look away if you don't want the spoiler for the second one okay because it's going to pop up on screen and it was a bit of a a bit of a giveaway I won't read that one out just in case anybody hasn't read the ruin so you know that one was a bit on the nose but despite the fact that those Twitter pitches are, to me right now, pretty embarrassing, I mean, I look at them and I just think, oh my God, I could have done a whole lot better. Um, a literary agent did like one of my pitches, I can't remember which one, and I was very excited and it meant I sent her off my first 50 pages and my query letter. The rest of the book wasn't ready, but I felt that was kind of reasonably polished. I sent that off. And then I kind of forgot about it because if you're an aspiring writer, you know how this goes, you know? like. For your first book, you're just keeping your fingers crossed for a personalized rejection from an agent. Like if they actually write you a letter and tell you why you're rubbish specifically, it means they read enough of your book that they know. And they're taking the time to actually encourage you by telling you where you're going wrong. So that's all I was hoping for at this stage, genuinely. Um, and also, you know, it takes months and months and months as a general rule. And this did take quite some long time. So then on a particular morning when other very dramatic things were going on in my life, which I won't even go to today, I got an email early in the morning, which I'm going to pop up on screen because it's one of these emails every writer just dreams of. And this is what the email said. Dear Dervla, and that's how I usually spell my name, by the way, the Irish way. Thank you for your query. If your novel is still available, could you please send the entire manuscript to X email address attached as a Word document titled with the book title and date? Please also include the original query letter in the body of your email and CC X for tracking purposes. I don't ask for exclusive submissions because I feel they're unfair to authors, but I do ask that you check in with me if you get an offer of representation while I'm still considering, and that you give me a chance to read and respond. I would only need a few days before making a final decision. Can you please confirm that this is acceptable to you? Thanks so much. I very much look forward to reading your manuscript best, etc. Now, I don't know if you can understand what it's like to get an email like that, but I very nearly lost my mind. This was a major New York literary agent 
who had read enough of my pages to know if I was completely rubbish and she wanted to read the rest of my book. And I was so excited, despite the very dramatic things that were going on in my life at the time. Um, and then I basically, so I, I polished the manuscript over a few days and then I sent it to her. Maybe if I hadn't had other things going on in my life at that time, I might've waited a bit longer to really polish it up, but I couldn't for other reasons. So I sent it to her and I sent it to a few other agents that I had on a list that I'd already been preparing over the previous year, you know, more procrastination basically. And then um, about six weeks after that, I got my first offer from a literary agent to represent me. And I got a couple of other offers after that, which again was just very surreal for me. And when it all settled down and the agency thing was sorted out, the book went out on submission and we ended up getting six offers of publication in Australia for The Ruin, which was extraordinary. And I got to go to Sydney and Melbourne and meet with editors and publishers and talk about my book. And I don't think I said two words. I know you probably find that hard to believe because I'm a bit of a blatherer, but in those meetings, I was very quiet because I was A, intimidated and B, the whole thing felt utterly surreal and, and hard to believe that it was actually happening but it settled down in the end and, and life continued and I went back to work and got on with writing and we moved on you know um so that was my journey to becoming a writer I became a full-time writer in October 2018 which is hard to believe god I thought it was more recent than that um and I always felt that you know once you took that plunge you'd have all this wealth of time on your hands to write the reality isn't always like that because like with everything other things start to creep in over time that isn't just writing. You know, there's always going to be email editing and promotional stuff and different things. So your, your writing time isn't as generous as you think originally, but it is still a beautiful way to live, you know, to have the flexibility of spending the time with the kids and then also getting your writing done. And, you know, you're at home for nine months of the year, quietly working on a story. And then for about three months, you're out meeting people and talking about it. And like, that's not a bad balance, you know? So I'm extraordinarily lucky. That's probably enough about writing. And um, I would love to tell you a little bit about where the ideas behind the books come from. I might tell you a little bit about the ideas behind The Ruin and then tell you, and then I'll just talk a little bit about The Good Turn and then we can get to questions and stuff, if that works for everybody. So with The Ruin, which was my first book, um, Basically, all I had at the beginning was a single scene, which I've talked about before. And the other books didn't work like this. But with The Ruin, it started, I had this picture in my mind from the very beginning of these two children, Maud and Jack. Maud is 15, Jack is five, and they're alone in this crumbling country house in the middle of the Irish countryside. Now, this house is rushing around them. It's a grand house, or it was once but the grandeur has long since faded. You know, the wallpaper is peeling off the walls. It's damp, it smells, there's no electricity, it's getting dark outside. And these two children are sitting on the stairs and they're holding hands and they're afraid. And I knew that Maud, I knew how she felt about Jack. I knew she had loved her brother from the moment he was born and that she had protected him and kept him safe and that she was desperate to keep him safe, but she was afraid, she didn't know what was gonna happen next and she didn't know if she could protect him from what was coming. Now that sounds like a very fully realized idea, but it's actually only a seed. I mean, I didn't really know what had brought them to that place. And I didn't really know what was gonna happen. I, I felt that Maud was going to make an enormous sacrifice for Jack. And I knew that I wanted to find out what was gonna be left for her after she had done that. So those were the sort of questions I had in my mind, but there was very little, like there was a very little development of that story. But what I want to talk about a little bit tonight is, you know, where do the seeds of those ideas come from? Because that question gets asked an awful lot at writers' festivals and at writers' events. And it's a hard one to answer when you haven't got a lot of time. So we tend to kind of joke it off and say, oh, there's a, there's a story shop or something like that, which is a bit silly. But that's because it's a hard one to answer. So let me try and answer it from the perspective of the ruin, at least. So if Tim, if you can help me out with a couple more pictures, I'm going to show you um, something from... A little bit sort of a taste of my childhood if you like now these are not specific photographs to my childhood they're more just to give you examples i lived um i had a very what i call a free-range childhood in that i lived i had a very loving family but you know my parents were busy and we had a lot of freedom and when i was about 10 i lived in limerick and we lived at the very outer edges of the city and our where we lived bordered farmland so we used to my friends and i used to hop hop the wall at the end of the road and go down into the fields where we would play. 
And one of the features of the Irish countryside, of course, is abandoned buildings, you know, from, from castles to grand estate houses that have been burned out to abandoned farm buildings and everything in between. And we just accept that as entirely normal. You know, it's only when I've lived abroad that I realise that it isn't quite standard in every country. But these places were often our, our places we played, you know, and um, those, this is, these are more photographs. In the previous picture, there was a picture of some abandoned farm buildings and that, while not for the one from home, is very much um, like a building that was close to home. And we were obviously both completely enticed by um, these buildings and a little bit afraid of them at the same time, but they were very inspirational in terms of places to play. This is a grander example of one of the old estate houses. Um, if you know anything about Irish history, you would know that, that Ireland was obviously colonised by um, the English for a long time. And we had a landed gentry class of, of people who were largely Protestant and owned these vast landed estates. And they had tenants who were largely Irish Catholics. And these beautiful houses, in many cases, um, over the course of Irish history, have either been burned out or simply abandoned as they became impractical. And they still have some stunningly beautiful features, but they're not safe and they're just left there in large, large, um, largely to rot. But if, Tim, if, you're, if you can go on to the next picture, this is one um, that hasn't been left to rot. This is um, in Newtown Forbes. This is Castle Forbes. Now, I looked everywhere on the net to get you guys actual pictures of this house, but I couldn't because it is a private home. It has been occupied over the years by the Earls, Earls of Granard, and I think it's occupied by the daughter of the sixth Earl of Granard now, and it is a private home. So the entrance is actually from a little village, Newtown Forbes, where my dad's family live, and the main picture is just the only one I could find of the house. The only thing is I got to see a little bit more of this because once I went to Longford on a visit and my aunt took me and a lot of the other kids over the wall um, at the end of the field again and into the private gardens of the castle. And we wandered down these paths, probably completely trespassing, as they opened out to show these extraordinary lily ponds and these walled gardens and these hidden places, you know. And that is just such fodder for a kid with an active imagination. And I was always conscious of two things, both this hidden grandeur and the fading grandeur, and also the division in Irish society, you know, the sense of isolation between Catholic people who were living this sort of very ordinary life, if you like, because well, certainly when I was young, Ireland was a very classless society. And this class of people who were connected to, it felt to me at least another time. And obviously it isn't the case for most Protestants or most people who are Church of Ireland in Ireland today. But at the time it felt that there was this history there. And when I was writing about these two children, Maud and Jack, and part of their isolation came from the fact that they were connected to this other heritage and the village saw them as other. And so even though there would have been an awareness in the village of some of what these young children were going through, they, they weren't considered the business of the village and so they were left alone and that explained some of how they came to be in the situ situation they were in obviously utterly wrongly but that was the sort of thing that I felt happened and it felt real to me in Ireland so I think maybe I hope that that sort of traces for you a little bit of where the ideas come from I mean there's one other element to that seed of course which is the relationship between Maud and Jack now I had three brothers and three sisters growing up my two youngest sisters there was a quite a, an age gap between us and I felt that same protectiveness, I think, that Maud felt towards Jack to my two younger sisters. It's an almost maternal thing, you know, there wasn't that normal sibling rivalry between us. Instead, I felt this intense protectiveness. So that also came from my experience in my life. So I don't know if that helps. I think some of you are probably writers. I don't know if that helps. But in terms of where understanding where the ideas come from, I guess it's your own life and how you view the world how you see everything, all the things you see, you see them through the prism of your own experience. And that's why two writers could be inspired by the same event and write entirely different books. So hopefully maybe that gives you a little bit of an insight. So I might turn now to talk about The Good Turn a little bit before we go to questions. So I don't think I've shown you a picture. Here is The Good Turn. This is the cover. And um, this is my new book. And it's the third book in the Cormac Riley series. I haven't really talked about The Scholar tonight, but I don't think we've, we have time to go there. So I'll just tell you a little bit about the story. Um, so the story, the heart of the story really is Anna Collins. Anna is this very young single mother living in North Dublin in really rough circumstances. And she is a little girl called Tilly and Tilly has stopped speaking. In fact, Tilly hasn't spoken in three months. And Anna takes Tilly to the doctor kind of under duress 
and the doctor feels that maybe there's no physical reason for Tilly not to be speaking. So he thinks maybe there's some, she's experienced some sort of trauma. Anna thinks he's going to call in the social workers. She feels like there's a risk that she's going to lose Tilly. And so she runs. She takes her, she gets in the bus, she goes to the far west coast of Ireland to a tiny little fishing village right out on the west coast. Um, meanwhile, back in Galway, another young girl has been abducted and Cormac Riley and Peter Fisher are doing everything they can to find her before it's too late. Um, but weirdly, they're not getting the support that they should be getting from the hierarchy within the police force. In fact, they're cut right down to a skeleton crew. And um, in that kind of situation, under that kind of pressure, Peter makes a fatal mistake. And he is effectively all but banished to a little fishing village on the far west coast. So we've got Peter and Anna in this little village. And then back in Galway, we've got Cormac trying to get to the bottom of you know, why he didn't, they didn't, thank you, Gail, why they didn't get the support that they should be getting from the police force. And um, also trying to understand, you know, there were suggestions of police corruption at the beginning of the ruin, and maybe even through the scholar. And he is finally getting to the bottom of all of this. He's really trying to save himself to save Peter and maybe even the greater good. So I might read you a little teeny tiny reading from the beginning of the good turn, just to give you a flavor for it. What can I do for you today? Anna, is it? The doctor's eyes were kind. Anna sat. Tilly hovered beside her. It's Tilly, Anna said. Her teacher said I should come and see you. Had demanded it, actually. Had picked up the phone and threatened to call in the social worker if Anna didn't do as she was told. Yes? Because Tilly hasn't been speaking, Anna said. The doctor's eyes flicked to the little girl. He gave her an encouraging smile. Right. And how long has this been going on? About a month, said Anna. A month, he frowned. Anna swallowed. It had been three months, three months of silence. Yes, she said. The doctor was more concerned now. Anna could see it, could see the beginnings of mistrust hidden behind a veneer of warmth. So that's just a little bit from the very beginning of The Good Turn. And I guess we've talked about where the ruin came from. So just very briefly about um, the good turn and where that came from. When I'm writing a book, before I start writing a book, I always need to find at least one character that makes me feel things very, very strongly, like a really strong emotional response. And that emotional response is what carries me through the writing of 100,000 words and you know two years on a book. So I know I need to have that before I begin. And with the ruin, that was really Maud. With the scholar, it was mostly Della Lambert, a little bit Carleen, but mostly Della, even though she's barely on the page. With The Good Turn, it was a little bit different because I had Anna, who absolutely fulfilled that role for me. I love her as a character. But I also had Peter. And Peter had been there from the very beginning, this young cop who is there in the ruin, and he's really just raw ambition and not much else in the ruin. And you see, I knew why. I knew the reasons behind that. I knew about his relationship with his father, which isn't doesn't appear in The Ruin or The Scholar at all. And I really liked that dynamic and I wanted to explore it. And I also wanted to test Peter because in The Scholar, he kind of makes comes into his own. I won't say more than that for spoilers sake. Um, but he, I wanted to test him more and really see the metal of him and did he how he would come out the end of that. And I felt I could get the opportunity to do that in The Good Turn. And then, of course, this Cormac, who is really my protagonist and, and my cop. And, you know, he's been on quite a journey across the ruin and the scholar. But there were things that were unresolved for him, you know, I mean, his relationship, but also who he really is as a man and how he sees himself in the world. If he loses his position within the police force, which has always formed so much part of his identity, who is he at the end of that? So I wanted to kind of answer that question. And also I wanted to complete the arc. I mean, I wrote the books intending that they could be read singly, but there's no question for me at least that they're most satisfying read together. And I felt like the ruin and scholar, if I had left it there, they would have been not complete. So I wrote the good turn with the intention that the arc would be would feel satisfying and complete for the reader. That's not to say that I won't come back and write a Cormac book again, although my next one is not a Cormac book, but I I felt that the books at least were, were complete and the reader would have a fully satisfying experience reading all three. So that is what I wanted to say to you about The Good Turn. Uh, I'd love to answer your questions if you have any, if Tim has something he wants to throw up on the screen. Um, but feel free to ask because it's fun to talk to you guys. Aha, 
Andrew's question. When do you realize that the final draft is the final draft? Oh my God, Andrew, that's such a good question. Um, and the best answer I've heard is from Natasha Lester, who I asked this question back before I was published. I asked Natasha, when do you know that your draft is ready to send to an agent, you know? And she kind of took a breath and she thought about it and she said, um, oh God, she said, well, the first thing I'll say is every writer friend I've asked this question of has said they sent their book in too soon. I certainly feel that way. You know, we all do looking back retrospectively and we see what we could have done to improve it. But she said, obviously that's not helpful because you need to make a decision. So she said, look, it's when you cannot think of a single other thing to do to improve the book. You literally cannot think of a single other thing to do. Now that's a horrible answer to give to an aspiring writer because you know, by draft five or six, you really don't want to look at the thing again, and yet you know you can do more to improve it. Um, so it's not a nice answer, but it's a truthful answer. It is when you literally cannot think of a single thing to improve it, then you know it's ready to send, and you just have to send it and hold your breath. But do set it aside for three months at least and come back to it. Don't send it unless you've given it that time to mature because you will see other things when you come away and you read it fresh again. Hope that helps. Oh, hi, Riley. Thank you. So Riley wants to know, where do I get, when do I get my insights into police processes? Um, a few different places. My brother has a friend who is a serving detective sergeant in the police force in Ireland. And so I was lucky enough to be able to have a few conversations with him, which put me right on a few things. Um, I do some amount of online research and it's weird the places you actually get information from. Like I've read the Garda Siakona um, annual reports. <laughs> which are as dry a read as any annual report is, believe it or not. Um, but what you get from things like that is really interesting, sort of like how they talk about their own work, you know, how they consider it and, and the language that they use. And you can then import that into your books and it can really help from a, a feeling of authenticity. Now, I have to say, I absolutely cheat sometimes, you know, for the sake of the story, because there are some things that are unrealistic, like Cormac really should be more senior than he is as a detective sergeant. He probably should be a detective inspector. But if he was, he would never leave the police station in all likelihood. He'd just be supervising large teams. And then even as a detective sergeant, he probably should be spending more time with the paperwork. But that's not very interesting from a reader's point of view. So I look for the kind of core truth in something and I try to reflect that in the book, but I do adapt stuff so that it serves the story, if that makes sense. Thank you for asking, Riley. Oh, Deborah. Oh, I'm sorry. I know lots of people have been asking about um, a UK date for the good turn. I don't have one, but I might have news on that very soon. So I will post it to Facebook as soon as I can. And I may have news in just a couple of weeks. So hang in there. And thank you for asking. Oh, my God. Sue, how did I feel when the good turn hit number one? Jeez, it was it was amazing. Like, it was amazing. You know, I was on tour. I was over east on tour. I was traveling around with Alice is my campaign manager from HarperCollins. And we were going to amazing events and visiting bookshops. And, um, you, you you know, we were in week two or week three of that. And you, you're kind of in a bubble. You don't really hear much about what's going on in terms of how things are going. And then things start, little, little hints of how things are going start to trickle through. And, you know, the news sounded like it was going to be really good, but you just couldn't be sure. And then I was in a readings, I think, in Melbourne. And Alice's phone rang and she just kind of took me by the arm. We went outside, we went around the corner and up, up a little alleyway and she put it on speaker. And it was my editor, Anna, my gorgeous editor, Anna, who had the news. And I swear we were like kids. We like, we jumped up and down <laughs> with excitement. And it was such a lovely moment. And I think one of the reasons it was so nice is because it was shared with Anna and Alice who've been with me, like we've worked together from the very beginning. And and it was just lovely. And so it was wildly exciting to go to number one across all categories in Australia as a blow in, you know, as a re relatively recent immigrant and for people to embrace the books. And like as we went around to, to, to um, events, people were coming who'd read the first two books. And like, you don't know what that feels like as a writer for someone to come to you and say, I loved your books and I got this the day it came out. Like, I know what that feels like as a reader because I feel like that all the time. But to think that other people feel that way about my books is is very humbling and shocking still and lovely. And I, that was happening more and more. And that combined with it going to number one was just amazing. So it was, a, I'll never forget that feeling. It was fantastic. Thank you. Gabby wants to know if I'll always write crime or if there's another genre I'd like to explore. Um, that's a really interesting one, Gabby. I, there's only one other thing I'm writing and that's with my little girl. We write, um, we've been writing a book together, which is like a middle grade fantasy. 
which is what she loves. So this book heavily features dragons, but it's just for us. It's just for fun, even though it's like I'm really enjoying it. Um, I used to read fantasy. I grew up reading fantasy. That was my passion all the way through my teens and 20s, really, before I kind of came to crime. Um, so probably largely crime. I just feel like there's a lot of room to explore lots of different stories in, in the crime genre. I mean, the, the breadth of books that are published under that um, moniker is just crazy. So I don't feel in any way restricted by that 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 a label and it's also what I like to read you know can still now that's what I read more than anything so I, I think it would probably be largely crime fiction for me oh Karen what is my next book my next book is a little bit different actually I had planned to write a Carrie O'Halloran book Carrie is my female cop in the earlier of the Irish books and I was thinking about writing that book in fact, I was 10,000 words into it. And then, but I had this idea that I'd been carrying around for a long time and it was nagging at me and nagging at me. And I really wanted to write it, but it just felt really linear. It felt like a really straight idea. It was too straight, you know, couldn't find the angles into it. And then I was having a chat with my agent on the phone one day and I hung up the phone and I walked away and I went, ah, oh, I just, I realized I could like flip this idea over, just like invert it. And suddenly it had all the things I liked about it, but it was also a lot more interesting. So um, that then, that was all I wanted to write. I was the only book I could write after that. But it's actually an American story. It had to be an American story. And you'll know why when eventually it's published sometime next year. Um, but it, it just, I'm excited about it, you know. I mean, I'm excited about the characters. It's its probably tone-wise and feel voice-wise, it's probably quite similar to my other books. But it's a little bit faster, maybe. And there are a lot of twists, but the twists are sort of baked into the characters, if that makes sense. This is all sounding terribly boasty, but I'm at that really excited stage with the book um, where I haven't, like, it hasn't piled. I've only written three drafts. So by the time, you know, I'm still, still fresh. I'm sure I'll hate it by the time it's being published. But anyway, I'm very excited about it right now. So I don't have a title or anything. And that's probably all I could say about it at the moment. But that will be out next year sometime. Thank you for asking. Do I write a path or an outline for my books or do I let the story take me along for the ride? Um, I do both. I start, I do a lot of prep before I start writing the book. I do a lot of work on the characters. So like I mentioned earlier, I find a character I feel very strongly about and I will write his or her entire backstory. I mean, down to their first boyfriend and um, that they broke their arm falling off the monkey bars in school. Everything and anything that sort of makes that person come alive for me. So that by the time I'm writing them in a scene, I feel like I know them. I feel like they're real and everything flows a bit more naturally. So I certainly do a lot of work on characters before I start writing. After I've done character work, I usually do a few. Um, I do a, like a very rough kind of outline, like a list of maybe nine scenes I really am excited to write, like the ones I think are going to be juicy or fun to write for the story. Um, and I write a little paragraph on each of those. Then I usually just start writing. I write about 30,000 words ish. And then I'll stop and look at what I've got. Now, at that point, I'll write a full outline for the entire book from the very beginning right to the end, right to what's going to happen at the end of the book. And then I go back and I start writing the whole thing from scratch. I write the book. But one of the things I have learned is um, I have to be able to ignore the outline if the book demands it. At a certain point, you may find that the book just loses its life and becomes it's sort of a dead thing. And you can keep writing in that situation because you can write with your head, no problem. But you can feel it. You can feel it in, in the resulting book and readers will absolutely feel it. Like if I feel it's dead, you are going to feel it's dead for sure. So I have done that in the past. You know, I've written 25, 30,000 words like that and then had to go back and cut the whole thing because I could just see it wasn't right. So now I've learned to trust my instinct a bit more and know that if it's if it's starting to feel dead, it's dead. And it's time to cut the dead wood, go back to the last place it felt alive, throw the outline out and start again. And you have a better book for it. So I absolutely outline, but I also let the story take me along for a ride. So it's kind of 50-50, if that makes any kind of sense. And I think we've time for about two or three more if we have that many. Gabby, will my books be made into films or TV series? I hope so. Um, the book was optioned by Hopscotch. Um, features, which was enormously exciting. And I was so thrilled um, that they were excited about the book. Um, and then things kind of went quiet for a while, as they tend to do with these things. And then late last year, I got a phone call. Actually, I was in Sydney for something with Alice. And I got a phone call 
And someone sort of said, Colin Farrell. And I said, what, what, what now? And they said, Colin Farrell, don't tell anyone. I was like, what am I not telling anybody? Anyway, the news was very exciting. So Colin Farrell and his sister Claudine have set up a production company in Ireland and one of their first projects is um, The Ruin. Um, so they are producing it. And Lee Magaday, who produced The Favourite, which is a movie I absolutely love um, and thoroughly enjoyed, she is also involved with her production company. So I'm really, really excited about it. Um, but my friends who are writers who have been down this path have said to me, don't even think about it until the day they start filming. And even then, don't think about it until it's on the TV screen. So um, I'm trying not to think about it, frankly, and just get on with my job, which is writing, writing the books. But it is very exciting and um, fingers crossed. Thank you, Gabby. Oh my God, favorite crime writers, Kate. I have so many. And um, let me see, where do I begin? Tana French will always come to mind. If you haven't read her, she's fabulous. The first book is called In the Woods and her first two books were adapted for TV and they were on SBS as uh, Dublin Murders, I think. We just watched it and it was really, really good. Val McDermott, I've always loved. She's a fantastic writer, always has been and thankfully has an enormous backlist, which is such a treat if you haven't read her before. And um, gosh, who else? Michael Conley and Ian Rankin old favorites and perennial favorites. I will still buy every single book that they um, that they write and grab them. The books I've really enjoyed lately, um, Robert Galbraith's books, the ones JK Rowling has been writing, they're just a masterclass in series writing. You know, I just adore them. The last book, Lethal White, broke my heart when it ended, but thankfully there's a new one coming out, I think September, if they haven't pushed it back. So I'm excited about that. Um, actually, there's one I'm reading right now, which is on the desk because I'm reading at the moment, Simon Lellick. The Search Party. Simon's a British writer and this is not out yet. This won't be out for a few months and I'm not sure if the cover will be the same. Hopefully it will be so you'll recognise it. It's fantastic. I'm really enjoying it. And the, sorry, two more uh, that I've been listening to on audio. Harlan Coben. He wrote The Stranger, which was on TV recently. If you watched it on Netflix, it was brilliant. And he's a new book out called Boy in the Woods, which I listened to on audio. And it's fantastic. And there's this female character who's a lawyer called Hester, an older woman. And oh my God, I defy you not to fall in love with her for the very first pages. That's brilliant. And at the moment, I'm listening to Candace Fox's new book, Gathering Darkness, on audio. And oh my God, she just goes from strength to strength. It's amazing. Those are just a handful. I could go on all night about, about crime writers I love, but those are a few that hopefully will inspire you. I'd say we might have time. If we have any more, we might have time for one more, maybe. Tim, are we out of questions? Maybe that's it. I think that might be it. Well, guys, thank you very much for coming along. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to you all tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for all your wonderful questions. Thanks for listening. And I hope to see you again in the future. Enjoy your reading. Good night. <laughs>